that may be the most pleasant video I've ever seen. <laughs> I didn't see it until this morning. And I was like, oh my God. Um, let me hit you with this. Is anyone else in the room very aware of the fact that this time of year we are inundated with Christmas music? We are surrounded by Christmas music. You're in the dentist chair getting like a cavity filled, right? And it's just Christmas music in the background. You're in Atlanta traffic, bumper to bumper. It's just Christmas music coming through. You're at your house trying to chase around your kids. It's Christmas music just coming through all the time. And it's just everywhere you go, it's Christmas music. And uh, we, we sometimes just passively just listen to and receive the music. And then other times we actively sing along with it. But, uh, and let's just all be honest in the room. What is the song that we hear most often this time of year? Mariah Carey, that was the right answer. Yes, it's a great song, but enough already. There's other Christmas songs. I like that someone got that. <laughs> That's funny. We all were thinking it. You said it. Thank you. And so we, we're just kind of inundated with Christmas music. And so here's the, here's the thing. What we want to do is we want to leverage this, all the songs we're listening to and singing. We want to leverage this in order to kind of pull these songs into view and specifically the Christmas hymns and Christmas carols that the church has sung for centuries. And what we want to do is while we're hearing them and, and singing them, we want to unpack the layers of depth to these songs because there are deep layers to these songs and rich theology. And so as we do this, we're going to show you, hey, this song let us give you the biblical background on this and so we can pull out biblical truth that applies to our lives. Hey, let's, let's actually tell you the backstory of how we got this song. And that tells you a lot about like, what the song means and how it's been transmitted and, and kind of the history and the tradition of the church. And what we hope is that as we do this, these songs will then hit different when we sing them. It won't just be like, you know, blah, 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 herald sing. Like, it's like, no, 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 no. You're invested. You're, you're cognizant of the words. And we can have a deeper experience and a more contemplative experience of singing together. And our hope is that as we do this, when you go to sing these songs in the future, while you're singing, you're also learning and being taught scripture and biblical truth. But you're also worshiping. You're also telling God who he is, his worth, his value, his glory, and, and celebrating what he's done and what he's called us to do. And so that's what we're doing this series. And, and, and here's been my experience. Let me just hit you with a personal experience. Um, I don't know if I've shared this uh, on a Sunday morning, but I started out in church as a worship leader. That's like how I got into church, like back in like eighth grade, eons and eons ago. And I noticed every time, like we, we would sing these songs throughout the year, right? Throughout the year, and these songs we call them like praise and worship songs, and people would engage emotionally and viscerally, and they would raise their hands, and they would open their palms, and they would sometimes kneel down, and there was like this emotional engagement, and they would sing the words and love the words. Then, all of a sudden, it would come like November, end of November would roll around, beginning of December, we start playing Christmas songs, and what was kind of fervent, ardent worship invested all in, it was just kind of like, like people lean in and be like, oh, I like this song, they got you that song, they got you that song, and like, I would be playing and like, why is everyone just like staring at me creepy? Like, it was weird. I'm like, where's the, the investment? Where's the hand raised? And so I noticed this passivity. And this kind of worked out two different ways. Some people, they just loved Christmas music and they wanted to be kind of passive consumers of it, which isn't an evil thing, but I don't think it's the best thing. And then sometimes this turned into pickiness too, because they'd be like, they'd be sitting back and be like, they haven't done Christmas shoes yet. I'm like, I'm not doing Christmas shoes, okay? I'm not saying it's a bad song. It's not a good one. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not stepping on Christmas shoes. Shoes, okay? But like that was a, a requested song. So sometimes I would, I would see that this kind of passivity or just a preferentiality. Like, yo, if they don't do Silent Night at the Christmas service, I'm out. At the Christmas Eve service, I'm out. And so there's this kind of passivity. And then I'd even have some people say, you know what, Matt? I really just, I kind of take the month of December off because like I want to sing worship songs. I'm, I don't want to sing these Christmas songs anymore. I want to get to January when we can start singing Christmas songs. And I started thinking about that, and that bothered me, because I'm like, well, these songs we sing at Christmas are hymns. They are worship. They are deep theology, deep biblical truth, and beautiful and profound. And so what I purpose to do is kind of bring these together. Like, hey, what we sing here, we can see it expressed here. And I want us to bring kind of both together so we can sing these songs with more purpose and more meaning. And here, here's another obstacle, I think, and another challenge that we face. If you've gone to church for any amount of time, you know, I mean, Christmas season can become a little rote, right? 
Right, we're going to enjoy to the world, blah, blah, blah. Oh, holy night, blah, blah, blah. Silent night, blah, blah, blah. Then we like blow out the candle. All right, presents. Where are my presents? Give me presents, 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 presents. And it kind of is this like whole routine. I want to disrupt that today. I want to disrupt the whole routine. I want to disrupt the passivity. I want to disrupt the, oh, I'm ready to sing worship songs. I want to disrupt this whole road, just kind of tired. Yeah, we know, we know. I want to disrupt that and bring our attention to something deeper. And here's a deep conviction that I hold. In this season especially, if you want entertainment, there's infinite number of streaming services that can give you Christmas entertainment. If you want pageantry, there's infinite number of Christmas shows you can go see around town. But I think people want something deeper. I think people want to be connected to something bigger going on. Something filled with awe and wonder. Something real and true and transcendent. That's what I think people really want. And I know that's what people's souls are longing for. And so that's what we want to get at in the series. And as this is the first sermon in the series, today is going to be a call to worship and an invitation to participation. If you have sermon notes, you can fill it out there. The other sermon notes, we're going to cut those, okay? So just do that first one. That's the only one today. Boom, Anticipate, invitation to participation. No longer kind of this passive, but active, singing these songs with intentionality and fervor and energy. And we want to worship together. And so we're going to see this series, this sequence, this pattern unfold in our series of preparation, anticipation, proclamation, and adoration. And I'm going to set us up with preparation today as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship through the singing, to tell the Lord how glory-filled and wonderful he is and celebrate what he's done and what he's called us to. And in this, we are going to find ourselves singing these songs that are, pay attention to this, timeless they have been sung from, by those who came before us. They are sung worldwide. As we're singing these Christmas songs, there's people all over the world singing. That's profound. And people will sing them after us. And what we'll see today is that actually some of these songs, some of these words have be, been sung since eternity past, before creation. They're sung currently today in the heavenly realm. And they will be sung into eternity future. And so I want us to have the sense of this grandeur of these songs, the grandeur of the experience we have. And today, we're going to get in the first song, Oh, come all ye faithful. All right, who's a fan of the song in the room? Show of hands, NMC Plus, let me know. Okay, now, if you're in the room, shout it out. If you're on NMC Plus, type it in. Who does the best version of the song? Let me hear it. Pentatonix, Pentatonix is the wrong answer. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry, sorry. Anyone, the right answer is Nat King Cole. Did anyone say Nat King Cole? Anyone say, someone said, yeah, okay, cool. Thank you. That was the correct answer. And we're gonna unpack this song and... We're going to look at the biblical texts in Luke's birth narratives, and we're, we're going to kind of trace that and then see how the song aligns with those events and what it teaches us and how it's going to encourage us and invite us to engage. So we're going to be in Luke 2, 1 through 20. You can get that out, and I'm going to give you some background from the Old Testament because that's my thing. And let me, uh, let me set this up for you. At the very beginning of the Bible, we need to know this to understand what happens in the New Testament. There's this book called Genesis. And in Genesis, long and short of it, the Lord creates humanity, Adam and Eve, he creates them and places them in creation, in his good creation, so that they will bring his right rule and reign. Focus on that, right rule and reign upon the earth. They will rule well and that things will go how the Lord intended for them to be, to go and how the Lord intended for creation to flourish. And that's what they were called to do and to obey and worship the Lord. But humanity doesn't do this. Humanity falls away. They rebel. They sin. They bring more evil and violence and wickedness to the earth. And there's ill consequences to that. And in the rest of Genesis, it kind of like, it kind of sputters out of control from there. But then the Lord decides, hey, I'm going to elect this nation, Israel. And Israel is actually, they're going to be my new representatives. And they are going to represent my right rule and reign upon this earth. And through them, I'm going to work to restore good creation that was kind of broken and fractured with human sin and violence and, dis and rebellion and disobedience. So I'm going to restore, and they're going to bring my right rule and reign. They're going to actually image me as my image bearers to all other nations. And if you're a part of NMCU, our discipleship process, you're hip to this. If you're not, you better mess around and sign up for NMCU. Do it. Sign up for it. Sign ups are open now. And... So the Lord kind of, this nation arises, Israel, and they have all these kings, one of them being David, their greatest king. 
And Israel fumbles it too. And they fail to be a part of the restoration of good creation. They fail to demonstrate the right rule and reign of the Lord on the earth. They fail to image God and be his representatives and his presence on the earth. And so in this kind of hopelessness and failure, the Lord perpetually makes these promises. And he makes a promise to Israel that through Israel, he is going to bring about a king. And this king, everyone say a king. That's gonna be the focus of today, a king. Everyone say a king. This king is going to be the one from Israel, from actually, pay attention to this, from the line and the descendancy of their greatest king, David. In fact, this king actually is gonna be born in the very city of David, which is, which is Bethlehem. And this king will perfectly begin to restore the good creation, to bring the Lord's right rule and reign upon the earth. And this, this king actually uh, would be the presence of God on the earth. Almost as if like the Lord is making his, his presence, making his dwelling among people. And they coined a phrase or this phrase came about, this title came about for a king and it was Messiah. Everyone say Messiah. And we gotta keep that locked in. And in fact, this Messiah that they were waiting for, this king that they were waiting for, they also believed would be called, he would be a son of man and a son of God. In fact, some would call him son of God. Pay attention to that. And that eventually this king, this Messiah, this son of God would actually go on to forgive people's sins. He would take a punishment for sin so that people may be forgiven. And that's the Old Testament expectation for a king. It's all between Old Testament and New Testament. It's all the anticipation of a king, of this Messiah. And people waited. And a lot of people don't know this, but between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are 400 years of waiting. And Israel, this nation waiting for their Messiah has to endure exiles and conquest and suffering. And that is where we pick up in the New Testament. And when you open these birth narratives in the gospel of Luke, the gospel of count of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that's where you find yourself. They're waiting for this Messiah. Now let me set up the scene, the culture, the world of the day for these early birth narratives in Luke, what some people call the Christmas story, I call them the birth narratives of Luke. Let me set the scene because it's gonna, it's, it's gonna inform a lot of what we talk about today. So in this world of the New Testament, as the Israelites are still waiting on their Messiah, there was an empire that ruled the world and this empire was called Rome. And they ruled by military might and force and violence. And then Rome was ruled by one man named Caesar. Now, let me tell you a couple things about Caesar, and we're going to keep coming back to this. So Caesar was the ruler. He was the emperor, and he called himself a couple of different things. And all the Caesars called themselves different things. And one of the primary terms for Caesar was Lord. Caesar called himself Lord because he believed he was Lord of all things. In fact, like Lord of the world, because Rome had conquered most of the known world, he was Lord. And so even on the money that they would mint, it would have a face of Caesar, and it would say, Caesar is Lord. And this would be distributed throughout the empire, so people, you know, got hip to it, and they were aware. And in fact, colloquially, you would even, in your uh, exchanges with people, would be like, hey, how you doing? Caesar is Lord. Or you'd be like, oh, I gotta go. See you later. Caesar is Lord. And then you would go, like, that was just, everyone said it. And they believe that Caesar really ruled all. But then, there's this particular Caesar, and if you read in Luke 2, 1, you read about this Caesar. This guy was named Caesar Augustus. And Augustus means august one or divine one or honored one. And this dude thought he was divine. In fact, Caesar Augustus referred to himself as kind of two similar terms, son of God or son of a God. He believed not only was he Lord of the earth and Lord of everything that Rome conquered, but he also was the son of God. He was divine a son of man and a son of God. Hmm. Then the Caesar that came after him was this guy named Tiberius Caesar, who was Caesar for a lot of Jesus' life and his crucifixion. And Tiberius Caesar comes along and he, yeah, I'm Lord. Yeah, uh, we know like my, my dad was like son of a God and I'm in that descendancy, so I'm divine as well. But he also referred to himself as Soter, which means savior. So Caesar said, I am the savior of the world. And in fact, Tiberius Caesar had a coin minted because that was their move. And it would say, savior of the world with his likeness on it. And he would distribute it through the empire and people would get the idea. 
Then as Rome continued to expand, their armies would conquer people. Pay attention to this. You're going to see this later. The armies would conquer these new people groups, new land, new resources, and then they would sing, they would sing of Caesar's victory. And then the singing was considered <clears throat> euangelion, or good news. That's what Caesar's armies would sing. And then, pay attention to this too, Caesar would have messengers, or the armies would have messengers that would go from city to city that would be like, hey, good news, euangelion, Caesar is Lord. Hey, good news, euangelion, Caesar is Lord. Good, good, good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. But it wasn't good news for everybody. Now by a long shot. And so I need you to understand, this is where the world of the day. This is the world. Whenever you're reading the birth narratives in Luke, this is what they were living under. And the children of Israel were oppressed and they, had, they were living in their land, but they had this hostile empire burdening them down, trying to kind of co uh, coerce them away from following the one true and living God. And in fact, even cults emerged that would worship Caesar as a God or as the son of God. This was their world. And in this, in the early birth narratives, we see that darkness is broken by light. We see a disruption from the status quo. Something is different. And through a long sequence of events that we're just gonna kind of cover for the sake of time, just very succinctly, there's all these proclamations made of the birth of Jesus. And it's made explicitly clear to Mary, Jesus' mother, that Jesus will be the Messiah. In fact, the messenger of the Lord, the angel of the Lord said, he is from the line of David. He's gonna be born in the city of David, Bethlehem. This clear connection to this messianic expectation, this king that's going to come. In the book of Matthew, the messenger also says Jesus will be Emmanuel, God with us, as if the Lord's presence is dwelling on the earth. And Jesus' name in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means salvation of the Lord, or, and, and you can translate that as Savior. What? what? But what, Caesar is supposed to be Savior. Uh, not really, not so much. And we find that out with the birth proclamations to Mary. Well, then Jesus is born in Bethlehem from the line of David. He is Messiah. He is God with us. He is Savior. And then, so the camera at this point is kind of is zooming in to Bethlehem. And you have like Joseph and Mary and the baby. And then all of a sudden, all right, camera people, follow me. The camera pans over. If it's like a movie, the camera pans over to like a field and there's like a starry sky and there's some like, like stinky shepherds that have been out there for a while and sheep. And then the camera just stops on these shepherds. Well, the, like this would be weird because what you would expect is if we're talking about a king, a Messiah that they're waiting for, you would think the camera would pan over to like the wealthy and the influential and like the military and like, you know, people who have clout and say so. No, the camera pans to just this countryside, this rural scene with shepherds. And again, shepherds were kind of like lowly on the socioeconomic ladder. And so let's, uh, let's pick up the text in Luke 2, 8. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And this is going to also be kind of the setting of the song we're going to unpack. And so they're out there. And again, you're kind of surprised. You're like, the shepherds? Really? That's who? Like, what, like, why are we talking about shepherds right now? Shouldn't we go to the religious elite, the wealthy, the powerful, the army? No? Oh, okay. Let's see where this goes. And so the shepherds are out doing their thing, herding the sheep, and look what happens. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. Now, in the Old Testament, fear normally means like respect or honor. Uh, in this passage, it's where we get the word phobia from. They're literally afraid, like, oh, let's get scared, there's a big, big lion, I'm scared. Now, let's talk about this angel of the Lord. Uh, the Greek word for this is angelos, and it means, or angelos, and it just simply means messenger. I don't know if you're like me, but I grew up with like artwork depicting angels as, I don't know why, usually women, and they've got like the long flowing white robe, the blue Miss America sash, right? You know what I'm talking about? They got like the big pigeon wings. I don't know why. Don't take a picture of me doing this. That's embarrassing. Okay. They got the big pigeon wings. They got the halo. I don't know where people get that from. This word simply means a messenger of the Lord, an angelos of the Lord, appears to these shepherds. And so the shepherds are kind of taken back and there's this bright light and they can't explain what it is. And this happens often in scripture, this kind of reoccurring motif of this bright light. The messenger has their attention, they're enraptured. Let's look at what the messenger says. And the angel, the angelos, the messenger of the Lord said to them, fear not, 
because they're afraid. For behold, I bring you, what's he bringing? Good news of what? Great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, hello, a savior who is Christ the Lord. This is the message from the messenger, from the angel. And so I wanna talk about four words here, four words that we wanna unpack here. Good news, savior, Christ, and Lord. And so we see here that this messenger is proclaiming this good news. Uh, guess what word is used? Euangelion, which means good news. Now, who normally, whose army would go around and sing about Euangelion and good news, and whose messengers would go from town to town and proclaim good news to conquered people? Let me hear it loud. Who is it? Caesar. Caesar. Yeah. So this messenger has, a, he has better news. I would say good or good news, okay? Not grammatically correct, but don't judge me, okay? Good or good news. And let's unpack the next word. We're gonna find out what this good news is. Like, okay, it's good news. Well, what is the good news? Hey, a savior is born. Now, the word for savior here is the Greek word soter, which is, we've heard before because who else in this day called themselves savior? Let me hear it. Caesar, you guys gotta say Caesar, otherwise it's going really fall flat. All right, so who is it? Caesar, Caesar there you go. Man, first service was hype, come on, let's go. So, so the Savior, they thought Caesar was the Savior of the world, but now they're hearing that there's a Savior born and he is Christ the Lord. Now, when you see the word Christ, maybe you're like, well, hold up, you've been talking about a king and a Messiah, where did Christ come from? Well, Christ is actually a transliteration from this Hebrew word, Messiah, into Greek, Christ or Christos. Now, if you're like, bro, you just lost me, that was super confusing, let me make it simple. Whenever you see Christ in the New Testament, just substitute it for Messiah. Did that look like magic when I just did it? Yeah, it did, okay. <laughs> And so just see Messiah, the Messiah is born, the long awaited king, who they've been yearning for, who they've been waiting for in their darkness and their waiting and their oppression and their suffering. And then it goes on to say that this Messiah is Lord. Well, who in this day called themselves Lord? Caesar. Caesar. And so do you see all these infinite connections of good news? Well, Caesar's got good news. Ah, well, we got better news. Well, Caesar says he's so tear and savior of the world. Oh, uh, well, well, uh, Caesar says he is Lord. Mm, well, not really. And so we see this kind of polemic against Caesar and we see this good news. And we know that this good news is pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. And Jesus would be the one to restore, to begin to restore the good creation, to bring the Lord's right rule and reign on the earth, to perfectly image God unlike anybody else has ever done. And in fact, Jesus would be the presence of God on the earth, dwelling on the earth. Uh, in John's gospel, he says that God, the word, the first and last word, became flesh and made his dwelling among us in Jesus. It says in Colossians 1 that in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And so Jesus was like checking all the boxes of Messiah and that Jesus would go on to take on the punishment for sin so that people may stand forgiven, which we'll talk about more at the end. And so there's this incredible message to the shepherds. And then look what happens next. It ain't over. And this will be a sign for you. The messenger continues. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. All right, so we got to unpack this. So they hear this good news and there's all this like densely Roman language. And then all of a sudden they see this glimpse into the heavenly realm. And so what I want you to do is don't think of heaven like some like cosmic geographic location. Think of it as a realm on the other side of this realm or on the other side it is above, it is, is on the other side. And we see glimpses throughout scripture. We see little glimpses of heaven or moments where heaven and earth overlap. Again, if you're in NMCU, you're hip to this. And so they get to see, the shepherds get to see this, what's on the other side. It's almost like the veil is thinned between our reality and the heavenly realm. And they see this incredible scene of the hosts of heaven. Now, uh, we don't ever talk like this. No one's going around talking about, oh yeah, the host of heaven, the host of heaven, the host of heaven. What does this mean? Well, the word host in Greek means army. The shepherds look 
to the other side of this realm, they look to the heavens and they see this scene, this rare thing that rarely happens in scripture. They get to see into this incredible thing, this, this rapture scene, and there's an army singing praise and worship, glory. It says they're praising and they're giving glory and worth and value to the Lord. And they're proclaiming good news. Whose army of the day usually sang and proclaimed good news? I was trying to moonwalk over to it, but I don't know how to moonwalk. Okay, so yeah, Caesar. Just trying to switch it up, you know? And so we see, that's like a very Roman thing. And so there's this incredible scene where the veil is pulled back and they see what's really going on. There's a song going on. That was, and we know this from the Bible, that was going on in eternity past before creation. It's going on in their day and our day as well. And it will continue on into eternity future. And these shepherds get a glimpse into it. And so in response, they take off. They like Scooby-Doo run. And they take off and they begin to tell other people. And our lead pastor, Rob McDowell, is gonna really focus on this part of it and focus a little bit more on the shepherds and give you kind of another aspect of the story here in two weeks. But, but I wanna skip to verse 20 and show you how the shepherds respond and how they align with this incredible experience they've had. Verse 20, and the shepherds returned. They see the baby, they're telling other people. They return glorifying and praising God for all they heard and seen as it had been told them. And so the shepherds on the other side of this incredible event have the only right and proper response, and that is praise and glory. And what's so cool about this is the same word for praise that the, the army of heaven is singing, it's the same word used here. The shepherds are just praising the Lord. And as the heavenly hosts, we're saying, as this heavenly army are, are singing of this good news, and they're, they say glory to God in the highest, same word for glory is used here. They're glorifying God, telling him how much he is worth, celebrating what he has done, and how he's led them, and what he's calling them to do. It's this incredible thing that happens. And they, in this, are reflecting, pay attention to this, they're reflecting what they've seen and they're joining in the song. They are joining in this timeless song from eternity past, in the heavenlies, and in eternity future. It's a profound thing. And this is where we're gonna kind of bring it today. Now that we've unpacked the text, let us look for a couple moments at the text of this song of O Come All Ye Faithful. And actually, before we get into the lyrics of the song, I want to give you the background. We're going to see how it aligns with this text, and we're going to see how timeless this song is, too. So, oh, come all you faithful. If you didn't know this, uh, <laughs> this is pretty common to Christmas hymns and Christmas carols. Nobody knows who wrote it. It was like a ghost writer. And... Some suspect that there was these monks, a group of monks that wrote it. Some suspect that there was this uh, ruler in Portugal that wrote it in the 1600s. Some suspect that it was a missionary named St. Bonaventure. Regardless, this song was somehow preserved. This O Come All You Faithful song. The lyrics, the words were preserved. And then they were discovered by a man named John Francis Wade. And John Francis Wade, let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about his backstory and how how he encounters this text and these lyrics for this beautiful song that really elucidates this text we are in today in the Luke birth narratives. John Francis Wade is in England and England is having a religious war between Protestants and Catholics and there's oppression and persecution. So he's like, I gotta dip, I gotta get out of here. And so he flees and, he, and he's exiled in France. And so he and some of his, his Catholic cohorts are there and they say, hey, bro, can you go unearth some old hymns? We got, we, we got to figure out what we're going to sing together when we gather together corporately. And so he does the good work of trying to unearth, pay attention to that word. He's unearthing all these old songs that like people have forgotten about. And he encounters, oh, come all you faithful. And he's like, this one's a banger. This is a good one. And so his exact words, this is a banger. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that. I'm sorry. And so he takes these words and he begins, <clears throat> and he begins to score music to them. Beautiful, creative, brilliant music. And he brings these words to life. And then he brings it to the church and he puts it in this hymnal and the church begins to sing this incredible song and it has lasted and it's been transmitted and transmitted and spread and we still sing it today, which is pretty cool. That adds to the timelessness of the songs. Not only eternity past, what's going on in the heavenlies and, and eternity future, but even we're singing with people in the past. He was singing with people in the past, people from like 200 years before him. 
And, we're, and when we sing the song, we're singing with people worldwide, people singing in underground churches overseas, people singing right next door. It's an incredible thing. And people will come after us and still sing this beautiful song. And so then now you know the, the story of this song. Let me unpack the musicality of this song. And Stephanie's gonna assist me with this. And I'm a music nerd, I love music, and I listen to a lot of music podcasts that like unpack a song and say like, yo, this is why it's good. This is why it affects you this way. Ooh, look for this and it will make the song more rich and beautiful and compelling. And uh, if you're here in the room or watching online and you're not into music, that's tough, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's something for everyone in this. There's something for everyone in this. So when Wade, I'll use his last name, when Wade put this together, he scored it in 1751, and the music of the day was called choral music. It was written for choirs, usually like a big like pipe organ. I don't know if they're actually this big. I don't know why I pantomimed it that way. Uh, this big pipe organ, sometimes an orchestra, and it was very, pay attention to this, it was very complex and vivid musically. Lots of chords, lots of notes. And what's cool is this actually perfectly matches the, the verses of this song are written in this choral fashion from the 1700s. And so they really, the vividness of the music captures the vividness of the events that we just read about, about the, the, the messenger and the heavenly host and the shepherds and they run and they tell and they're praising and glorifying. There's a lot going on in the text and the verses musically capture this. So Stephanie, can you hit us with that? Lots of changes. See how complex that is? If you were playing guitar, you'd be like, ah, 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 slow down. And so lots going on, and it's more complex. And again, to match the complexity of events. Now, that's the good and beautiful thing about it. Maybe the more unfortunate thing is, because this was such a song style of the day, perhaps these verses had become a little rote. This music style had become a little rote, like, yeah, we know, ba, 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 ba. We sing like 10 other songs like that. But then what's incredible is in the chorus or in the refrain of, oh, come, let us adore him, the music, the whole bass cleft, like the whole bass of the song gets pulled out. All the in other instrumentation gets pulled away and it's just simple chorus, this simple refrain. And it starts on what's called the tonic or a one or the key of the song. So Stephanie, could you hit us with that? It's very simple. It's very simple. See how stripped down that is? Before it was like, ba, 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 ba. See how simple that is? And the only bass note you're getting is the one or the tonic of the song, the key of the song. And what's great about this, in case you're just like, boo, music nerdery, play Christmas shoes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we call that a callback. Uh, <laughs> But what's incredible about this is it created this beautiful simplicity. But even before that, think about people singing in the day, in, the, in like 1751 or whenever they're singing it. They're like, ba, 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 ba. We know that's really complicated. Da, da, da. And then there's a switch where it's like, boom, oh, come let. And everything's stripped away. And they're like, yo, this is different. And this, right for it, disrupted the way they sang the song. They couldn't just rotely be like, blah, 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 blah. They're like, oh, wait, the song's changed. I told first service, it's like if we were singing like an old school hymn on a pipe organ, and all of a sudden in the chorus, they like dropped like a fat hip hop beat. <laughs> You'd be like, whoa, what just happened? That was kind of a similar effect the, in the music of that day. And what's great about this kind of simple tonic pulling out all the other instruments is it created beautiful simplicity and unity. And sometimes based on all these complex events we read about, all these prophecies and these fulfillments, man, sometimes the right response is just simple praise and adoration and giving God glory, adoring the Lord for what he's done. And there was unity in this too, because if you're like, I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the verses, well, then it gets real simple on the course and we can all sing it together. And it was unifying. Stephanie, thank you. Let's give it up for Stephanie, writing instrumentation. So now that we talked about the musicality, I want to end today by talking about the lyrics of the song and unpacking them and telling you what we're going to sing here in a few moments. And so in the first verse, again, with complex, vivid music, we read, oh, or we sing, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Okay, two things stand out to me. I had never really focused on joyful and triumphant. Never really thought about it. 
But I was listening to this song on repeat this week, and I was going on a little walk with my daughter, Ruth. I was pushing her stroller, because you know, it's beautiful, 75 degrees, which it's December, people. What is this, Florida? Like, come on now. So we're, we're pushing her, and I hear this for the first time in a different way, joyful and triumphant. Well, if you truly know and truly own the fact that Jesus is Lord, that Caesar ain't Lord, that there's never been any ruler who's truly Lord or any religious way that's come about that is Lord, that does rule, well, it should fill us with joy and triumph. That no matter what is happening, Jesus is still Lord. Even though things are difficult, Jesus is still Lord. Yeah, but even though there's like pandemic and disease and plagues always in humanity, yeah, Jesus is still Lord. And so that should make us, that should fill us with joy and triumph. And so instead of kind of just being like, blah, 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 sipping coffee, blah, blah, we should sing with joy and triumph at the reign and rule of Jesus. We should feel hype about that. I feel that, amen. We should feel hype about that. Here's the other thing I wanna point out. It talks about Bethlehem. One of the amazing things that these old hymns do is they pull you into the text. They pull you into the events of these narratives. So it's like we're out in the fields with the shepherds, which leads me to the second verse. And it's like the shepherds, we can almost look up and see the hosts of heaven. And that's when we sing, see, sing choirs of angels, sing, sing in exaltation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God glory in the highest. And so I want you, when we sing that, think about that incredible and rapturous scene that they see, that we're singing and we're joining the time of song from creation, past, going on in the heavenlies and creation future. And we're joining with people who have come before us, like in the 16 and 1700s, people worldwide right now, and people who have come after us. Feel that, experience that when we sing it. Cool musical note on this. In old school recordings of this song, when the melody comes in at this part, the sing choirs of angels, they usually introduce harmonies and other melodies that create this cool swirling effect. Almost like you're hearing like this army of like different voices and voices from the past and voices worldwide and voices from the future. And they all kind of work together and harmonize. It's really beautiful. And so that's the second verse. I want you to think about that as we sing. Which leads us to the third verse. This is awesome. We'll sing, yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be what? Glory given. Word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. What? We talked about how Messiah was going to be the presence of God on the earth, the Son of Man and Son of God. We talked about in John how the Word was made flesh and made his dwelling among us. And in Jesus, the presence of God was pleased to dwell in fullness. And so we get this beautiful reminder of it here. And nerdy musical note, Traditionally, when this song is played, there's this weird chord played right either on word or right after called a half diminished seventh. And you're like, I care 0% about that. But if you heard it, it's like this weird extra full note. They like add these two different things that don't belong to the chord and you're like, whoa. It's almost like a daunting like, and like shakes the room. And it was to bring people's attention to the man. Jesus wasn't some dude. He was the presence of the Lord on the earth. God moved towards people. And, and his presence was made manifest among his people in Jesus. And so then we return to the simple refrain of, oh, come, let us adore him. But here's what we did for today. Clark and I worked on all this, and Clark helped me write this last part of the sermon, kind of talking about the, the notes and the musicality and the lyrics. And we put together this arrangement of, oh, come, all you faithful, and because of my past experience with people being like, oh, Pastor Matt, I wanna sing the songs we normally sing during the year, like the worship songs. I'm tired of the Christmas carols, like blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're gonna help with that. We're gonna pull some of these songs we normally sing or we'll sing after Christmas into these Christmas hymns and these Christmas carols. And so we're gonna mash up all, oh, come all ye faithful with a song we sing a lot called All Hail King Jesus. Because what we've been talking about today, a king. And so look at these lyrics we're gonna sing. All hail King Jesus. All hail the what? Of heaven and earth. In Jesus' day, who thought they were Lord? Yeah, but he's not. And nothing else has. And sometimes we give lordship to, like globally, people give lordship to different uh, political parties or uh, to, to the pursuit of wealth or to the, the pursuit of just being a better me and like my best me and whatever, make ourselves the idol. And like none of those things rule. Or people in fear say, oh man, like there's, like we talked about earlier, like disease and illness and, and, and depression, all these things, like they really rule, they are the way. Or like there's violence and like, no, nah, Jesus is Lord. And so we sing of his lordship. We know he has overcome. We know that he has the final win, the final say. 
And so when we sing this, hit that lordship of Jesus, let that hit you. And we'll sing this too, all hail King Jesus, all hail the what? Savior, savior of the world. Who in Jesus' day thought he was savior? Caesar, but he's not. And we know Jesus is Savior. And he was restoring the good creation. That he was bringing the Lord's right rule and reign upon the earth. He was the presence of God on the earth. And that Jesus would go on to die in order to bring about the forgiveness of sins. He would take the punishment for sin on himself that people might be forgiven. And it says in 2 Corinthians 15 that Jesus died in accordance with all the scriptures. It says in first, uh, the first chapter of Colossians, it says that Jesus was restoring and reconciling all of creation, all of things to the Father by his death on the cross. And in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus died once for all, for all those who would repent, turn to him, and, and trust to follow him. Jesus is Savior. Caesar is not. Jesus saves. He saves us from the darkness, from the hopelessness, from the endless cycles of destruction that we often perpetrate ourselves. Jesus is Savior. And so we recognize that he is Savior. Then we're gonna go into this final refrain and this will hit different. When we sing this, we're gonna to come to this bridge that says, lift up your shout. Let us join with all of heaven singing holy, holy. Uh, is that not like exactly what the shepherds saw and exactly what the shepherds ran and started doing? And so when we sing this, this is where we get at the timelessness of the song. We are not singing this song in isolation or only within the four walls of this church. It's bigger than that. And then we're gonna end by bringing back a final refrain from O Come All Ye Faithful. And we'll sing, we'll praise your name forever. You see, if you read the Bible, you know how the Bible ends. And it's not just the arrival or what we call in the church, the advent of Jesus. It's not just what we call now the inter-advent period of the church and the right rule and reign of Jesus on the earth, but there's also a second advent. And for centuries, the church has grounded themselves in the second advent, the second coming of Jesus at Christmas time. And this is often a lost practice. And so what we want to do when we sing this song is we want to root ourselves in, this, in not only the advent of Jesus, the arrival of the Messiah, not only his right rule and reign in this inter-advent period today, but the second advent, the second coming of Jesus, where he will fully restore creation, fully rule, manifest the presence of God on the earth fully, and bring all things back to good. And that has been a hope that has propelled the church forward for centuries. And that is a hope that you will see embedded in countless Christmas songs. And so I want to end today by inviting you to stand. And we're going to sing this out together. But before we do that, I'd like to speak a benediction over you, a blessing over you as we enter into this time to intentionally sing this. May you today as you are seeking, as all of our hearts long for something more, for something bigger, to be part of something bigger, to be a part of something that fills us with awe and wonder that is true and transcendent. May you find that in Jesus. May you find that in King Jesus. May you find that in Messiah. May you find that in what the Lord has done throughout history to bring about redemption and restoration. And today, may you not just sit passively by and just go, do I like this song? Do I like this arrangement? Are they gonna do the song you like? May you actively engage, hands up, whatever it takes, palms open. Maybe you just sit in stillness and meditate upon the words. Maybe you kneel. Whatever it is, may you actively engage in this Christmas season. This is an invitation to participation. And as we sing, may we realize this is not a song in isolation. We are singing not only with Eternity passed before creation, not only in the heavenlies like the shepherds got to see into, and not only and not just in the future where we know we will be around the throne singing glory, but we are singing with people worldwide, those who have come before us and those who have come after us. So may that fill you with that sense of being part of something bigger. May that fill you with that, that awe and wonder. And may we sing together.
Lord. Come on, let's sing that again. We'll praise your name forever. We'll praise your name forever. We'll praise your 